direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Hello, welcome to another installment of Billy Masters Live. I am, of course, Billy Masters. Who else would I be? And uh, today is, oh my God, press the button, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, June 30th. I can't read. Tuesday, June 30th, 2020. We are still in quarantine, kind of. I mean, you know, you wouldn't know it by looking outside and looking on the news, but we are. We are kind of still in quarantine. So uh, hopefully you're all taking care of yourselves and being safe and wear a fucking mask for God's sakes. Um, you know, whatever. I'm not militant. I'm not going to shoot you or shame you. Just wear a mask. You know, once you got the mask on, I actually forget I have it on. Although I also, to be fair, I leave the house very often completely forgetting to take the mask because it has not become second nature. But there is a mask and there are, there's a there's an assortment of masks in the car. So um, anyway, uh, before I get to the uh, anecdote of the day, there's a couple of things I want to mention. First off, th while this show is fabulous and this show is fabulous uh, and sexy, um, Thursday's show is going to be very interesting because we've got Sam Harris and Billy Gilman. So we are going to have two young gay men. Well, youngish gay men who started out as very young men on television and then really exploded before our very eyes. And, you know, this is interesting. When I put the show together, I always think to myself, who would I like together that would make an interesting combination and um, a, uh, a lead to, to interesting conversation? And who I wanted, just so you know, is... Sam Harris and Clay Aiken. I thought that would be a really interesting pairing. Clay Aiken doesn't get back to me. I don't know what it is. Anyway, oh, I see our third guest is there. Hello, I'm waving to you just so you know that I see you're there. Yes, he's waving back. God, it's tank top day apparently on Billy Masters Live. I don't know. I feel like I should change. Um, Anyway, uh, and the other thing is, I used to, um, I was very good friends with a New York radio personality named Lynn Samuels. People um, say that we actually, we, we don't sound alike, but we have a very similar uh, sensibility. And uh, since she died like five years ago, I, I kind of inherited her website and I found the most hysterical post to put up a uh, clip of her back in 2004. That is so pertinent to today. I'm not going to play it because it's seven minutes long, so don't look at it now. But it's at lynnsamuels.com, and it's the story about the diner in New York. So definitely go check it out. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and we still kind of need a social media assistant because we got somebody, I don't know, uh, you know, I mean, thank God for him, but you know. So uh, uh, anecdote of the day. Oh my God, did I even put the anecdote picture up? I don't think I did. Oh, for fuck's sake. Um, no, it's not here. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So I, I, you know, I'm not looking at you right now. Don't get upset. Uh, Kenny will be upset, but uh, sometimes you just got to go back and take care of things. So I have prided myself of getting photos and meeting uh, casts of ensemble shows. For example, Golden Girls. I've got every Golden Girl except Betty White. So she's got to make it through this pandemic because it's the only one I still need. Um, although, you know. Anyway. Um, and you know this is interesting because of our first guest. Uh, one of the one of the casts that I I liked and met most of the people on the cast were the cast of um, Desperate Housewives. See now he, there's a smile on his face. Oh, there's a laugh now. There's a guffaw. Um, and so. I have everybody, you know, photos with everybody on Desperate Housewives. Oh, God, now I got to put the glasses on because I'm old. Okay, there's the picture. Thank God. Okay, send it over. So um, 
I've got everybody from Desperate Housewives except, and this will be so surprising, Felicity Huffman, who I have met and must, and may I say, was the one of the nicest people I ever met and most genuine, admittedly, now a convicted felon, but she was really nice. The one you, well, there are two that you wouldn't have expected would be nice. He's looking now. First is Nicolette Sheridan, who was, so, first off, she is a big old fag hag. She is so much fun. And I had no problem. I, I mean, I never hit her. So I don't know how she would have been. And the other one was Terry Hatcher, who people say is very difficult. I don't know that. I just know that when I met her, she couldn't have been nicer. Now, Here's the photo. We're a little out of focus. She almost looks happy to be with me. But if you look at the eyes, look at her eyes. That's the same look she used to take, have when people took pictures of her out on dates with Ryan Seacrest. Just see. Do you see? It's a very similarity. Anyway, our first guest, that, that's it. That's the story. I mean, there's no punchline. It's just a story. Um, our first guest worked with Terry Hatcher and um, I saw him work with Terry Hatcher. Tom Judson was the pianist on the national tour of cabaret and maybe the musical director. Is that possible? No. Okay. He wasn't, um, but he was the pianist. He played the piano. What do you want from me? He played the piano. And um, I remember uh, seeing him in the in the orchestra, it used to be in a little uh, kind of picture frame. And I remember thinking, God, that guy is so hot. And he's such a good player. And um, then I got to know him as porn star Gus Maddox, who I don't know. I never put it together. Don't ask me why. Um, in his porn days. Well, I don't know. That might be past porn days. That's post-porn. Yeah. Well, it's pretty good for post-porn. But then he's also a pianist. And then he kind of combined, you know, nudity and musical talent. He's a very talented musician with his own touring show, Canned Ham. You know, there you go. Doesn't look so bad for a musician. I mean, he's no Itzhak Perlman. But, um, so, but I have a, uh, an interesting story about when I found out about his, uh, musical talents, but I'll wait till I bring him out here. So please welcome my first guest of the day, Tom Judson. Hey, Thank sweetie. You, Billy. I have to say, oh, I was wait, really, now you're I, I, you pardon me. I, I was really trying to figure out how are you going to tie me together? You're fine. Go ahead. Housewives. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it. Um, did you have, I mean, you, you know, Terry Hatcher was, um, uh, the Valley Sally Bowles, Bowles yeah. in the touring company that you played right. for. Um, do, did you have any particular run-ins with her, good or bad? I don't have any run-ins with her. I, it was very, it's very interesting working with Terry because um, a lot of interesting things about that experience. She was very distant. She really, really did not um, make herself one with the company. And uh -huh. now granted, it was her first stage show. She oh, had, I didn't know that. She had, I think she had done a cruise ship once years ago. <laughs> and it was, so she, she was learning on the job. And let's mm -hmm. face it, you know, uh, Sally Bowles and the MC, they are, they carry the show. So sure. she had a lot on her shoulders. She had a lot riding on it. She did it because she couldn't get any TV, TV work at the time. So and she, she was not there. terrible. Now, I, I saw the show. If I were in L.A., as you know, I have a videotape of the show, which I gave you. Right. Um, and so I would have shown a clip because I don't care about standards and practices. She's not <laughs> terrible. I mean, the accent came and went, but the singing was, you know, it was. Well, you know, th this is was, this was my funny experience. I was, um, by the way, I. Piano was the one instrument I did not play in that show. I played piano oh. on 42nd Street. I played. Oh, that's the, right. I played all the wind instruments in cabaret. But okay. um, once, every once in a while, they if you're in the show, they 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 swing you out so you could sit out and watch the show. Just every once, it happens every once in a while. And okay. I have to tell you, from sitting up on the bandstand upstage mm -hmm. and watching the show eight times a week, I actually thought she was pretty bad. Oh, and really? And so and she she got terrible reviews. So I mean, everything's working against her. Yeah, I almost didn't blame her for not being a real, you know, 
one of the gang. But so near the end of her six months, I was swung out one night to watch the show and I thought she was fabulous. Yeah. From out front, I thought she was fabulous. But and this is also the next, how long into the run? Is it like five, four or five months into the run? Yeah, okay. And, and, but then the funny thing is, then the next night I'm back up on the bandstand and I thought she was bad again. So there's <laughs> something about being out front. I mean, I thought yeah. she was, I thought she was really good. So, yeah, but, I thought but, she, she sang it well, and she sang well. And yeah. you know, like I said, the acting was fine. As I said, the act, I saw it in Boston. I don't remember how. Long that, was the the that was second stop. That was second stop. Oh, okay. So, so about, about five or six weeks into the run. Okay, so you know, as I said, the accent came and went when I saw her. Um, yeah. and so this is the picture I was going to show. Um, so this is you in Forty Second Street. Yes, that's Forty Second. Okay, Street. see, there you go. I forgot. Well, whatever. Um, <laughs> so how did but you I mean, get Forty? I did just say she, no, she was she was she was pretty chilly and difficult, but a few times after the run, like years later. I ran into her, and not only was she very, very nice, but she remembered my name. And as as we all know, that, that means a lot for a lot. Yeah, I have one of my friends watching this. He uh, has done uh, stand-in work on sets, and he, you know, usually like the stand-ins. You know, a lot of the stars don't even care. They're like, "All right, get out of the way. It's time for me." The ones that make an effort to be pleasant and remember your name, or even just say hello, you'd be. Am I I say you'd be amazed. The people watching would be amazed. Yeah. People don't say hello. They're not yeah. pleasant. They don't even look at you. You don't exist. So that does stand out. Um, did you ever see anything like bad, like temper tantrums or anything? No, never saw anything okay. like that. Well, you know, she was busy learning her lines. Um, <laughs> so, but I'm going to tell the story. Oh, shit. Another picture I should have found. Um, so I remember running into you on Broadway at Charles Bush and Julie Halston's uh, reunited. Oh, that's right. Reunion I forgot about that. Yeah. Of uh, Vampire Lesbians uh, by Charles Bush. You hadn't seen Charles for a while at that point. And I didn't know till you told me that you had started out, you had written in what was it incidental music for the original run yeah exactly um i wrote uh i wrote some incidental music for the the, Vamp the original run of vampire lessons were two one acts put together oh it's coma vampire coma or and, sleeping and beauty coma right? yeah so i i wrote um some incidental music for coma and then i wrote no i take it back incidental music for vampire <laughs> lesbians and uh, a theme song that was played before the curtain for coma okay and so I didn't know this. I remember seeing you there and I had known you through the porn world. I had been a judge for the gay VNs. You had won yes. performer of the year. <laughs> yep. Okay. And, um, and we oldest have been one. friends. Old, oldest yeah. One. Well, yes, that is true. And you know, you know, and, and I've told this story before, but, in the judges' room, there were a couple of judges that were against, you know, oh, that old man. But there was a huge contingent of like, shouldn't we be just judging the bot the body of so work? Funny. And um the, the, the it was overwhelming. I mean, there wasn't anybody even in second place for that. There was like one for somebody and one for somebody, and then there were like 20 for you. And um and I remember meeting you and I remember liking you and we connected. But when I saw you on Broadway and then we all snuck into the party, the after party. I remember that vividly. And Charles was wearing that fur hat. Um, and you told me about your musical background. That really surprised me because, as you know, and now people have started to know, um, I have a musical background. But when I got into writing the gossip column, I kept everything separate because I realized people could not understand piano and gossip, you know, or classical background or whatever. So I was just the gossip queen and that was fine. But the people that knew me knew this other side of me. Did people in gay porn know that side of you? Yes, because um, when I went into porn, I made it a point of letting people know of my the other the other side of my work in, in theater and music because I thought it would um, I thought it would enhance both careers. Mm -hmm. And how did I, that work out? Did it? It did. It yeah. very much so. Yeah, because I was 
I was whenever whenever they were shooting a porn movie and they needed somebody to read a lot of dialogue, I was the one they called. <laughs> Same. Cause, cause I, well, I, you could read number right. one and, and speak. And then um, conversely, I the first thing I did after leaving porn was the um, premiere of a Terrence McNally play, and oh, right. I got I got the call because the casting director was a was fan that of some me men. From, some men, yeah. Yeah. The, okay. the casting director was a fan of mine from porn, and because I was so vocal about it, knew that I was a musician to play the piano, and I had to play the piano in that show. So, wow. So yeah. So it re now when you left porn, did you make a decision that okay, I did this, it was fun, moving on, close that door. Well, you know, Billy, it was that night of the Gay Vienna Awards. Was it? It really was because I was forty five, mm -hmm. and I had you know I. I not that I set out to achieve a lot of goals in porn, but I had done everything I had wanted to do. I'd worked with most and of the people. And won the biggest I'd, award. And won the biggest award. And I really thought, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of places to take this from here. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's just going to be more of the same from this point. And so I, and I, I loved every minute of working in porn. I loved it. Great. So I thought, if I leave now, not only will my experiences be uniformly terrific, but I can sort of make a splash by winning this award and then leaving. Mm -hmm. And that's well, why I decided to go. Let me go back then. Why did you go into porn? Um, I guess I just always wanted to be a porn star. All right. Well, I mean, you were working as a musician at that point. Was it a lull? Was there a financial incentive or was it just for fun? Uh, it was for fun. Uh, it, the, the thumbnail version of how it all started mm -hmm. was yeah. when I was on tour with 42nd Street, which would have been 2003, I think. 2002, 2003. We were in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And um, my roommate from the show, he and I went to a gay bar. I think it's called The Saloon on Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis because there was going to be some porn star making an appearance there. I can't remember who it was. Presented by Shishi Baru. Uh -huh. And during the course of the evening, I met Shishi and she, th she said, let's have breakfast tomorrow. So I went wow. to her hotel and we had breakfast and she just said, I think you ought to go into porn. It was, it was a real Schwab's yeah. shot moment. And that was it. That so was it. did you, did you, what, what, did that surprise you? Did that take you aback or were you receptive? All three of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All of the above. Yeah. It was, I mean, come on. I mean, who's not going to be, flattered to have you know, one of the top directors in the business suggest you go into the business. And, and, you know, especially at my age, I was, I was well past the age that most people start in porn. So it was very flattering. And, you know, I've always been an exhibitionist and always loved sex. So it, and it worked out. It was really, it was just serendipitous because I couldn't do anything about it for six months because I still had that much left to go in my contract. Oh, right. You were <laughs> on tour. And just by coincidence, the last stop of my contract was L.A. Oh, wow. So it just worked out perfectly. I got to L.A. And, and she and I kept in touch all that time. Oh, and when great. I got to L.A., we had lunch one day. And she said, why don't you come just down and we'll shoot a scene and see how you like it. And so the same day that I did a, a performance of 42nd Street, that afternoon, I, I shot a my first porn scene. A solo or a duo? No, it was with Johnny Hazard and and a third person who I can't remember at the moment. That's okay. Johnny Hazard's enough. And was <laughs> it a good was a good experience? Obviously. I it loved have. it. Had so yeah. much fun. So much fun. It was great. <laughs> and then had to go and do 42nd Street that night. Which was surreal. <laughs> <laughs> You know, no, I believe I, I really, Terry. I believe Terry Hatcher had a similar schedule in cabaret. <laughs> Billy, there really there, that night there was one moment that I thought, "Whose life am I living?" Yeah, it was it was fantastic. It was great. Do you also look at it and think how lucky you've been? Because I mean, you've really gotten to do. I, I don't want to say everything you've wanted to do because I've read some things where you say you don't keep lists, but you have really 
fallen into opportunities that really worked out well for you. I'm sure there have been bad ones too. Uh, nothing terribly, terribly bad. I've, I've always been really open to new experiences and I have, I've really had one of the most interesting lives. I have to say it's been, it's been fantastic. And you could not have planned it. No, no way. No. Um, our mutual friend, we talked about Charles Bush. Um, since that time when we all were together at, um, at that benefit, um, more recently, you have been touring with him. And I should mention that before you were touring with Charles, I had seen you, uh, you had done your solo show, Can Tam, and I also saw you in Provincetown playing for Varla Jean Merman. Look at us there. Isn't that Oh, crazy? I love, you know, I adored this picture. It's one of my yeah, favorites. Yeah, that's great. Um, and what was the, you know, what was the experience like of sort of merging sort of the sexiness of what you've done in the porn life with music, with sort of gay icons in Provincetown or around the country? Well, uh, again, I don't want to say that I planned it. No, but I know that. back, it makes perfect sense that it happened that way. Right. And, and it was, so, so I, uh, apart from my musicianship, I like to think that just my presence on stage just brought a little frisson to the show. I agree with you. And to both to both performers to by both the way. to both, yeah. 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 And I believe now uh, you know very different performers needless to say, very different repertoire, very different styles of performing and where Varla you sort of had to kind of act and react to what she was doing. Charles, you are much more of the the backbone of the show. You are support for him both musically and also I believe psychologically. I think he really depends on you being there. I think he would concur with that, and I certainly yeah. do. Yeah, it, it, they're both Varla and Charles, and you know, my relationship with Charles is much deeper than because I I played for Varla for I guess two and a half years maybe, uh -huh. and I love Varla, and just the most amazing performer, and an yeah. amazing musician. She's and again, so another cool. one that you know what people don't know a classical background like you right. and I both have, um, really legit chops and a real musician like tears things apart and analyzes them and also writes these shows every year. Yeah. Very yeah. smart. Yeah, just, woman. So, just unbelievable creativity. Yeah. Charles, we're apart from the fact that we've known each other for 35 years now. Um, we, we, over the, I guess we've been working together for going on eight years. We, we absolutely, we, we bring out the best in each other's talents. It's, it is such a symbiotic relationship. It is, it is fantastic. I've never been more artistically challenged and fulfilled than oh, working with Charles. It's, it's just fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I always consider you an entrepreneur because you always have something going on. And what you've got <laughs> going on now, which just is bizarre until I saw them and then it made total sense, is you've got this T-shirt business. I do. I have a T-shirt business on Etsy. It's called Tom's Trendy Tees. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it again, it, I didn't plan it. It just happened. Uh, I've after the election in 2016, you know, when we were all losing our minds, I had to make some public, because I, I live in upstate New York in a very conservative red area. Oh. So I, I had to make some sort of statement. So I made a couple of anti-Trump t-shirts just to wear around town. And <laughs> and I just, through this website on online, and I really, I wish I could remember the thought process, but I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to, um, just for myself, to recreate, to, to, to make t-shirts from Broadway shows that never had t-shirts. Such as, if we look at uh, from... Uh, well, that's that's from the movie, the movie line. Yes, it, but that, that, that's... Right. But, but uh, the, the broad, like the Broadway show basically... Oh, well, maybe this. Well, sort of. That's also from a movie line. Well, it's a movie, but it's also a show. It's a play within the movie, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so I have basically any Broadway flop that you can think of. Mm -hmm. I have a T-shirt for it from the and it, whenever possible the original poster art. And what would this one be? That is 
That, that's an interesting one. That is I, from it's from the movie collection. That is the final card in the opening credits to What's Up, Doc. Wow, because I couldn't figure this one out. So thank you. And you know, Billy, it's funny because I made that one absolutely for myself. I thought, oh, that would be fun to have. And I thought, well, as long as I've worked on the design, I'll put it up on my shop. It's one of my biggest sellers. Oh, wow. I guess people love that movie. And now what about this one? That is, this is really, really gets into the weeds here. This separates yeah, the right. movie fan, men for the boys. <laughs> That is from the Moses supposes scene in Singing in the Rain mm -hmm. when they're in the, the vocal studio and they're all the different uh, signs on the wall, the mm -hmm. way that your embouchure should form the different vowels. <laughs> and uh, another one from the movie collection, of course, is... Yes, that, that is from, from Valley, Valley of, the Dolls. of the Dolls, of course. And that is uh, somebody, so a, 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 a customer of mine asked if, I could do a, a poster from Hit the Sky, which is the, oh, yeah, the show, show that Helen Lawson is in the Valley. So I went to the, and there is no, see most, by 99% of these things are like the one from Midsummer Madness. That actually is a recreation of the poster outside of the theater and aged mm -hmm. in wood, the same thing. And there is no shot of the outside of the theater for Hit the Sky. Oh. But just before they go to the stage, the variety spins into place. And that's so that's your out. image. And so I thought that'd be pretty fun. So tell people again where they can get you. You're on Etsy. Etsy. It's Etsy's oh, funny. It's hard to find sometimes because like my shop name is Tom's Trendy Tees, but there's no space and there's also no apostrophe. <laughs> so, so the easiest way to find me is just to Google Tom Judson and Etsy or Andy Mame t-shirt. Oh, and it'll, right. and it'll get you there. I, I have I have close to three hundred designs up uh, of different things. So, oh my God, this must be exhausting. It's fun. It's just, but fun. it gives you something to do during this pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of why I started the show. I'm like, all right, I guess I'll talk to people. That's what I do. <laughs> yeah. So we're just all making this up as we go along. Exactly, like life. Yeah, all right, exactly. And like your life, certainly. Yes. Um, I'm going to put you on hold. I'm going to my Good. next guest. We'll bring you back for the panel. I can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, my next guest, oh, I can actually kind of say uh, for a while we lived together, kind of. Um, he certainly organized my apartment to uh, not the degree he wanted to, but far more than I would have ever done. So, um, but. Uh, uh, his name is David Pevsner. And for those of you who know him, he composed some of the music in Naked Boy Singing, which, by the way, we're going to do a show about that. That's coming up. Um, but he was also always one of the hottest guys I'd ever seen. I didn't know anything about his past. I still would have had him in my apartment, though. I would have had him a little sooner, maybe at a discount. Um, so again, another man who uh, musically trained musician, a serious musician, but also looks a little like this, you know, as one does. You know, it's sort of like my pictures. Um, you know, sometimes you just, all you need to wear is a tie. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I was at, he wrote a one-man show about his experience. We'll talk about that. Uh, and he performed it around the country and recently did it at the Colony Theater in Bur Burbank. Burbank. I just know there's a wood ranch right next door because all I remember about that night is they were going to do retakes. And my friend said to me, ribs or retakes? And we went for the ribs. So I didn't stay for all the retakes. But um, Anyway, this is uh, his show is called Musical Comedy Whore, and he is a musical comedy whore, and he's also one of my dear friends, David Pemsner. Hey How there. are you, honey? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to see you. Good seeing you. We uh, we chatted. I don't know two weeks ago. We were just sort of catching up with each other. It's been a while. 
And then, you know, and then I was putting this, this show together and this week kind of fell into place. I went, why don't I have all kind of musicians who have interesting stories and pair them together? And the show kind of kept evolving because yeah. um, I didn't realize how similar people's stories were. And it's not that, you know, you've done porn, although you do have a, is it an OnlyFans page? I do. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump right to that. <laughs> so I, I'm not, you know, typically, you know me, I wouldn't be uh, shy about showing nudity, but we are on Facebook and they're like Nazis. So I just can't. Um, and I've almost gotten kick, kicked off Instagram about a thousand times. Oh, I know. It's just maddening. But so I'm curious. Um, in musical comedy whore, what I found out now, I, I'm going to go in the assumption people know something about you. But in case they don't know, actor, songwriter, singer, done things, did the, uh, fiddler, a national tour. Broadway. Yeah, there was, and Broadway. Uh, but there was also a, a different, a secret side to your life, which was you ended up escorting. You didn't right. do porn, but you were an escort. And um, musical comedy whore kind of brings that story together and melds the two worlds. And once you know that, the songs in Naked Boy singing and all the nasty songs, which are fun and clever, but a little nasty, they make total sense. So I'm curious, um, have you had any fallout from any of your former Broadway co-stars? Oh, no. Not at all. Was, I, was anyone surprised? No. I mean, every so often I'll get a message on Facebook saying, you know, like, hey, I just came across a photo of you on da 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 da. Like, I get people who, like, go, David, like, I'll see them out and about and be like, I just saw a naked picture of you. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'd probably put it up to myself. And, <laughs> and, and so I think that some people are really surprised by it all. But if they, not my friends, they always knew that there was that in me, you know. Um, but no, I've not had any, the only real fallback, fallout I've gotten is I've lost a couple of agents over the photos and, and stuff like that. But I'm okay right now, you know. I have people who believe in me because I, I do. I have a legit career. I've been doing TV mm -hmm. for however long. I still do theater, you know, did my show. Um, and there was also the web series. What was the web series? Um, Old Dogs and New Tricks. We actually just right. did it. Um, we just did a reading of the finale. Um, oh, we did, Zoom, we did a Zoom reading of it. It was a lot of fun. Kind of read oh, it. Cool. So my question is: Could you have done both at the same time when you started publicly, or did you have to keep? Ha if people had known either you were escorting or posing naked, could you have had the career that you had? I don't know. I don't think theater cares. Like in New York, I was just in the theater. Right. And honestly, I don't think they give a shit, you know? Right. And I really wasn't, I had done a couple of TV things, but nothing, you know, I did some soap stuff and whatever. So, and at, at the time though, I think it would have been, had I lived in LA and was attempting stuff. The, pro the thing is though, that we didn't really have the internet back then. So like a casting person couldn't Google me and be like, Oh, look at that. You right. know? Um, and honestly, one of my missions about the whole thing is, I don't think it should make a difference. Like, you know, to yeah. me, like, it's like, it's just one more thing that I do in my, and, and I try to, I try to approach it all just like I do with telling my story about being an escort while I was doing off-Broadway musicals, thus the musical comedy horror. Right. Try to find something, you know, there's something about it that I think is very artful and, and resonant and, and relevant and, and emotional. And that's what I try to do in everything that I do. So to me, everything is an outgrowth of my art, you know, and I always said that, you know, some say art, some say porn. Uh, okay. It's, it, it's in the eye of the beholder. Truly. Well, and it also seems to me again, when one looks at like a photo like this, this is not, I mean, there are some more hardcore -ish photos. Right. This is an artistic photo. Yeah. I mean, there's something funny about it that I'm wearing this like Lucy. Tie. I love Lucy. Tie, yeah. I mean, I, truly, you know, whether it's just portraits or whether we're telling a story through photos or with videos now, um, I, I always try to like just have some other layer to it that's beyond just like, you know, so it's it's fun. I mean, it's fun. It's 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 an I have always had a lot to say about sex. That's how I started yes. songwriting. You know, right. and so this is just another way for me to kind of 
talk about it because I wrote a book that's um, my story told through the lens of body shame and sexuality. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm trying to get that published now. I have my show, I have the videos and the photo. I have a lot to say about it because in, in a nutshell, I think that America's attitude about sex sucks. And I think it affects us not only as adults. I mean, I get messages from guys all over the world saying that they, you know, they feel shitty about themselves and they've always felt guilty and it's always affected their sex lives. But kids, you know, kids who are just kind of coming up, they have these terrible, um, uh, uh, I don't know, just, just messages. everything you read about. Yeah, messages about sex. <laughs> See now, the word goes out. Sometimes I'm like, all right. <laughs> or, that word, the. Um, <laughs> No, but uh, they get these terrible messages about sex right. and sexuality, like, you know, you're gonna, it's going to fall off. It's you know, like, it makes right. me crazy and I'm done with it. And I want to do what I can to kind of progress the conversation. Well, I, I just noticed that she, she has been watching and commenting. So hi, she, she, uh -oh, um, and she's commented all over uh, Tom's interview. So Tom, when we're done, you'll be able to look back at it. Um, and um, you know what, what, is interesting and i'm sure she she would agree is that while what you're saying is true also there has never been so much nudity in gay porn available everybody with a webcam is a porn star and everybody with a phone has a nude photo of themselves somewhere so it, that you know it's interesting that the hypocrisy of the message has gotten louder as the usage has gotten louder as well and i'll bet that everybody who you know could would want to do it but can't because of jobs or they would do it like well, that's probably true. There is because now would they not do it because of their job or because of their own shame? All of it, you yeah. know. I mean, like I know, for instance, that there's no way I'm getting a Disney or a Nickelodeon show. No way. And you know what? Let's well, maybe on. Disney Plus. I don't even know about that. <laughs> but, but 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 I don't think it should be an issue, except that's what I was told. But I'm not listening to whatever anybody's telling me. Because I've already, yeah. you know, during this period where I was, was doing photos, I did, um, I'm dying up here. I did Silicon Valley. I did, right. people who don't give a shit. And honestly, right. those are the people I want to work with. Well, and also, I mean, you know, and I say this with love, you're not big enough doing the nudity. I mean, you're big enough, but, you know, is a name oh. to be an issue. Do you know I, what I mean? And I'm somebody so would really have to look. I'm just going about my business, doing what I believe in, enjoying it, definitely, but yes, also right. kind of making, I've just decided, once I decided that this is my mission, I I dove straight into it and I'm doing what I need to do, especially during the pandemic. Right. That's kind of what, that's kind of what um, pushed the button on the videos, because I shot a bunch of kind of arty, arty sex videos, and mm -hmm. I wasn't really doing anything with them. But then when the pandemic came along, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it because the further away I am people like on a daily basis in my ear, the more I don't give a shit. Right. And it felt really authentic to me to, to really dive into it. Um, yeah, I'm old, but that's part of my and, thing, anti-ageism, you know? Well, and also what are you jeopardizing, especially during a pandemic? Cause there's nothing else going on. I mean, we know online things last forever and I have it in the back of my head that these shows at first, when I started doing them, I didn't care about the lights and the green screen and everything. And somebody said, you know, these will live forever. I'm thinking I'm just doing something during a pandemic. But once something's online, it has legs. True. But and you, but there's only so much you can control. Or sometimes when people want to control that much, they're just not going to do it because it's it becomes too, it's there's crippling. too, many, too many obstacles. Right. So mm -hmm. my thing is kind of like, as long as I'm I'm... I like what I put out there. Not only, you know, my show, my book, any performance I've ever given, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't want to put out crap, you know? Right. So um, I really try to keep it, um, to keep it so that I can look at myself in the mirror at night and feel good about what I've done, you know? Now, do you no. live with regrets thinking to yourself, you know, if I thought of doing this and felt this way 20 years ago, I, I would have been 20 years younger and hotter. No, well, because part of it and part of it is this anti-ageism thing, you know, that that's part of my kind of mission is that, you know, just because I'm 61, I'm not dead. I'm not falling apart. And yeah, I'm softer than I was. And, you know, um, at least, you know, physically. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. But um, 
but to me, that's part of the whole thing is that like, you don't all, all of a sudden become irrelevant. Right. You know? But at 41, I, you would have been a little bit more relevant. Maybe, but I wouldn't have been ready to do it then. I was too like, okay, that's my, my career, question. my family, my, I couldn't do it. Like right now, I really have very few shits to give because right. I'm doing what I feel is truthful. And what I feel like people are, you know, the people who do follow me on anything that I do, uh -huh. um, are happy and it's making them feel good and it's making me feel good that they feel good. And, and I keep the messages open so that they can get in touch with me and say, Hey, what do you like? Sometimes people will say like, Hey, my boyfriend treats me terribly and I don't know what to do about what do you think? And right. you know, I'm not a shrink or anything, but if they're not getting any positive messages where they live, then yeah. I'm happy to step in and say, nobody should treat you like that. You have to find it in you to be able to say, no, I don't accept that. You know, But on the other hand, let me just play devil's advocate for a second. The last time you and I talked, we talked about both of us have not been the most successful in relationships. Oh, look, absolutely. <laughs> but that having said that, yeah, I could be I could be better for somebody else in their relationship. Like I have from what everything that I have learned, you know, in my life. And anytime anybody asks me a question about a relationship, I kind of know the answer. But personally, <laughs> the part is, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever be able to get into a relationship. I haven't wanted it for many years because I had a really shitty one that I talk about in the show, right. you know, that would that would stop anybody from wanting a relation, another one. Well, but, you know, that that relationship is very interesting when you talk about it because there were so many things at play in it. But ultimately, you walk away saying it was the wrong person because if it was the right person, those things may not have made a difference. Right. However, in oh. saying it's the wrong person, which, yes, I mean, I came out of it sadder but wiser because he pushed all my buttons and that's not right. a good way to have a relationship. However, I came out of it much smarter like i had to go through the hell of it to come right. out and be like okay i'm a better person for it i know myself better now i know what to look for and i wasn't the one that was the problem in the relationship even though it may have started that way because of my escorting in the end i was still the, the person that i am i'm I, you know i'm a very loving caretaking fun i mean like i know what i bring to a relationship and right. What we saw was escort, ex escort. I was like, no. Well, people are branded. You know, when you were on Broadway, ah, oh, he's a Broadway performer. Um, what's interesting in the show, and again, let me just mention the show again: musical comedy horror. There it is. Um, and coming soon, eventually, we're going to be able to see it. We're hoping that, yeah, because we shot it a while back. It took a long time in post. We have some good news, but I'm not really allowed to talk about it yet. Okay, but that's fine. But it is coming. I hope so. Okay, and it's great. I mean, I can say as somebody who, because David knows, but maybe not everyone else does. <laughs> I am vicious with my friends. Like, if this thing's I don't like... Girl, rewrite that, or you got to reshoot that. I mean, I really had such a great time at the show, and I and you're a very engaging a performer and storyteller. What I've always thought about you is that really, no matter what you're doing, you are a storyteller. And what was interesting in the show is that while the um, we talked about the two different worlds, your Broadway career kind of kind of inadvertently helped your escorting career because people, some P clients did recognize you. Well, at the time though- well, Off-Broadway, off-Broadway. I was doing, I was doing, um, I started when I was doing Party Off-Broadway and oh, then party. I did, and then I did When Pigs Fly. And I do tell a story in the film and it's one of my, my favorite moments where um, after, because I would do my show and then I would get paged from this um, company that I worked for called Maturity Escorts for older, older escorts. I was 38 at the time. And I walked in one day and I kind of had my experience with this guy in the hotel room. And just as I was leaving, he was like, can I ask you? And he went over to his suitcase and pulled out the program from my show. He saw uh, it. He saw it just that night. And went, and at the time there wasn't the internet and pictures. Yeah, of course. He didn't know what I looked like. So when I walked in, he was kind of like, I just saw him on stage an hour ago. But that was a good yeah. thing. For yeah. Him. What'd you say? That was a good thing for him. Well, I hope so. But the, but the, <laughs> The best is the punchline, though, because at the end, when I said to him, you know, you don't really need to talk about this. And he goes to me, he goes, I'm from Dubuque. Who would I tell? <laughs>
And there were no chat boards then. No, nowhere he could get on and say, guess who walked in? Guess who I paid tonight? It was <laughs> a great part of my life. I learned so much about myself. I, I did something I always kind of wanted to do. Just like now, I mean, the, I, I just hate the idea of being, you know, I mean, 61 now, how much more time do I really have? But I hate the idea of being 80 years old and going, I didn't do that. I really wanted right. to, I didn't. Yeah. Do you think to yourself now, Tom, we had Tom on just a second ago, talking about that he had always wanted to do porn. Did you want to do porn? Well, I wrote that song for Naked Boy Singing called The Perky you Little did. Porn Star from Skokie, Illinois, which is where I'm from. And it was a fantasy of mine in a way. But first off, you know, I was a really skinny kid and I just thought, no, that's never going to happen. And I always kind of like I've had a couple of, you know, people have kind of intimated to me that they might want me to do it. And I just wasn't ready. It wasn't kind of my thing to do it that way. Like she, she never invited you to breakfast. She she never invited me to breakfast. Me neither. Wah, wah. I know. Sorry. But but I love her. I mean, I love she. she I love. Adore and Tom, her. and I've known Tom. I met Tom during Cabaret in LA. We actually we were at, I think it was an opening night party or something, and we met, they had the hot tub on and we sat and chatted for a good long time. And um he's so nodding vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope he that's what he's doing. And it's just so funny because the whole Desperate Housewife, that was my first TV thing when I came out. And I agree with you on Nicola Sheridan. Uh, she was the nicest one. Yeah. The nicest. And I remember, I, I so remember on Sunday night when I saw you and texted you that night mm -hmm. saying, I just, because I didn't know you were going to be on. Was It was an outdoor scene. It was a party planner or something. What no, I, did, I actually did two episodes. I was a waiter in both of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, All it, right. was, I do it was minor. But... um. You know, that thing about Terry Hatcher, about a cabaret, yeah. funny, because I saw it twice. It was Rob Marshall, who choreographed or co-choreographed it, was a friend of mine. And so I got to see the show in previews in L.A. and then later. And I, I have to agree that early on, she was just terrible. But later on, I was kind of like, she's pretty good. You know, yeah. not, not as great as Natasha Richardson, but yeah. I was like very, you know, substantial, like much better, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, I adore you. I could sit and talk forever, but I've got to get to my next guest. But you'll come back and we'll all be chatting together about nasty things. All right, we'll be back. Uh, oh, my next guest. So <laughs> this is this is just the most bizarre story about our next guest. So Florian Klein, when he I, I don't remember the sequence of events, but I know that we became friends on Facebook and I don't remember who friended who, but I didn't put it together who he was. And again, I have said this before. I'm a gay VN judge. I'm friends with Michael Lucas. I'm friends with all she, she and all these people. I've got every video known to me and in, well, in Los Angeles, they're not here at the parents' house. Um, <laughs> But um, I don't know. I guess when I saw him online, I had no idea who he was uh, to the point that the first thing I asked him was if he was Romanian, because I know four Florians and they're all Romanian. He's not Romanian. Um, and we started chatting. And then he told me he had done a sh written a show called Shooting Star, a revealing music, new musical. OK, the irony about Shooting Star. I still haven't seen it. Twice I tried. One time something happened on my end and the other time something happened on the show's end. But then, of course, I went back and said, oh, Florian Klein was Hans Berlin. And I'm like, oh, and he worked for Michael Lucas. And like, I don't know where I was. Sometimes I just sort of zone out or I do pigeonhole people. So, uh, and, but we have met and we have spent time together and he's just a delight. And I hope I'm going to get to see his show at some point when the pandemic is over. I know that he had plans in the works for New York and maybe Philadelphia, but he'll tell us all about it. Florian Klein is with us. Oh, another tank top. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Titties out. And you know, I know. I want them. I have a really bad uh, sunburn on my back, so this is the only thing that I can wear right now. It's the only thing. You know, you didn't have to oh. put on a shirt for us. It's fine. Um, so first off, where are you? Where are you pandemicing? I'm in New York. I'm in Brooklyn at my house. And you had, before the pandemic, weren't you part of a writer's conference or something? Well, like a workshop or something? What were you I doing? Did a, I did 
I did a Broadway uh, producing uh, uh, lecture workshop for 14 yes. weeks. And this, it started uh, with the Broadway League uh, uh, in the Broadway the Theater District. And then it, right. it became a Zoom workshop. Right. Because I remember you and I had seen each other at uh, Women Behind Bars in Los Angeles. And we were talking yes. about and we were talking and I was asking you what's going on with your show. And we talked about it, and you told me you're doing this workshop. So obviously everything is on hold right now. Correct. Yes. And um, did you have something planned? Where were you in in the uh, process? Well, Last year was the first uh, first time we did Shooting Star we ever in front of an audience. And one of the things I find very interesting is that you, like most of the Broadway shows that you see have been in development for like 10 years, seven to 10 years. I had no idea. So meaning after LA this year, I plan to do uh, rewrites on the show. And then I wanted to bring the show to Chicago next uh, uh, Pride season. Because as they right, said, it should be fabulous. City, yeah, right. Because as they said in the Sex and the City, uh, first the gays, then the girls, and then the rest. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because then the next step would be an off Broadway transfer in the fall of twenty one. But now, as we don't know if the second wave is going to hit, uh, yeah. I'm restructuring it now, rethinking it now, and want to create a digital version of it, which could be a oh. series. Uh, which could be a filmed staged version. If you go on Netflix, there's Shrek the musical or a sure. movie musical adaption. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, because that's interesting. Could that it be a series? When you mentioned series, could it be a yeah. series? Do you have an idea where these characters would go? Well, the, the 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 musical is about two hours long, so I right. just uh, I just have to develop the the, the scenes a little longer. And sure. I've been I've been looking at uh, East Siders. They started out as as a, as a web series, web series, and then made it to yeah. ne Netflix. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 remember, the first season was was uh, you could stream it as a whole movie or in different episodes. So it's kind of the thing that we could do as well. And I've and only I think been talking after, to a platform. I think after Forever did that as well. That I watched it all okay. together, but it was little episodes. Okay. Yeah, I'm already talking to a platform, but I can't really talk about that yet. But we have to go with the Corona flow, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, now, how had you been involved in theater or music before the porn career? Well, I'm originally from Germany. I came yes. to the States, to New York in 2002 to study acting. I did, I did a lot of entertainment, uh, general G-rated entertainment in, in Germany. Like I was, I was doing, I was hosting some TV shows. I was part of a very unsuccessful boy band in the mid nineties. Um, <laughs> Which band? And, it was called FAM, Florian Armando Marco. We did a Latino version of I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight because I'm so Latino. You're so um, Latino. Oh. I know. It was released with B&G. Uh, we, we never created a music video, so it was very oh. unsuccessful. We sold about 700 CDs back then all over Europe. Uh, uh -huh. But that was that was it. So 2002, I came to New York to study acting. In 2006, I moved to L.A. to become the German Brad Pitt. That didn't really work out as planned. And in 2012, I got recruited to do porn. I was dancing at Mickey's. I was go-go dancing at Mickey's. because I, I so up many with some, others. Right. I hooked up with some dancers that were dancing there. And they said, you could still work as a dancer because that was already in my late 30s. Um, so another then, one that came to it really late. Yeah, yeah. So in 2012, yeah, in 2012, I gave in. I thought at first I thought like I can't do this because I'm a real actor. I'm going to destroy my acting career. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I thought, no, I don't really have an acting career. I love sex. And why not become a star in a different universe? So in, in June 2012, so exactly about eight years ago, I did mm -hmm. my first porno. And who is that for? It was for a website called manhandled.com. They don't exist mm -hmm. anymore because no. I had um, I went to San Francisco for Gay Pride for dancing and had my first interview with Titan and mm -hmm. they wanted to shoot in July 2012. And then a friend of mine said, you know, manhandled.com, they're looking for someone um, to film with them and uh, they shoot in two days. Uh, and that was in June. And I thought, OK, I'm I have to mentally prepare to do porn. But then yeah. they showed me who my scene partner was. Yeah. And I Johnny, but it was not Johnny Ryder, but something like that. I only know his real name now and I don't want to say it. That's um, okay. But he was super hot. So I said, OK, I'm going to shoot my first porno. Because you would have had sex with him anyway. 
Probably. And the funny thing was, it was at a hotel in Anaheim next to Disneyland. There you go. Back to your roots, the G-rated roots. Totally, yes. Um, so now, how did the idea of the musical come along? Um, well, first of all, I think that every actor in L.A. has an idea for a script, uh, yes. never a musical. But one of the first uh, porn partners that I had was Jesse Aris. Do you know him? Do you remember I him? I do, yep. Yeah. yeah. Re remember that he's doing all his singing? He had like this music career that he put mm -hmm. all of his porn money into. Yep. And he I financed, thought, I think he used his porn career to finance a CD, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, correctly. Correct. And he was he was performing at like Mickey's and other places in a jock strap and sneakers and was singing songs like I'm your porn star. And I don't know. I shot with him. He started singing a little bit. I thought a singing porn star, porn musical. And that's how the idea of porn, the musical was born. And one of the things I don't know if we can get political here, but one of the things sure. I still lo love about this country is you have a crazy idea. You always find people that say, hey, sounds interesting. Work on it. I said, I've never written a musical before. Well, buy some books, go online. So I looked how Rent was written, uh, how Fiddler on the Roof was written, how oh, wow. Suzy is written. Um, and I started writing my first musical and took me several years, um, had my first reading in Berlin at the Gay and Lesbian Museum in 2015 with no wow. music yet. Found my composer there, who is German, who lives in Berlin. He said, I want to write the music. Went back to New York because then I had moved to New York because I was kind of done with L.A. Found my mm -hmm. lyricist, Eric Ransom, who uh, rewrote the lyrics that I had already written, added beautiful mm -hmm. lyrics. And now it's the three of us. We did some workshops in New York. I found investors. I did not find an, uh, a producer. So one of my very good friends, Stephen Fales, uh, you probably, mm -hmm. yes. He yeah. said, uh, who, who's the writer of Confessions of a Mormon Boy? Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. And and he said, you know, nobody's going to care about your show as much as you do. So why don't you produce it yourself? So I found mm -hmm. investors, raised $200,000 last year and produced the first installment of Shooting Star because I've learned that porn, the musical, people were expecting dancing dildos and, porn, and, and, yeah. and priests that sing, we love porn. And <laughs> Shooting Star is a legit musical. The only thing is what it makes it porny is the setting that it's that it's set in the world of gay porn but it's right. the story of people it's the same thing as rent is not about aids it's or right. about homeless people it's about people in general and that's what shooting star is about and it's a big cast right how many we people in the cast we had 10 people in the cast it's, yeah, it's eight, eight principles big. yeah it's pretty big for an off-broadway show because right. uh shooting star at this point, is never, not going to go to Broadway. Um, it took Hedwig and the Angry Inch 25 years, I think, to go to Broadway. So for now, we're off Broadway. So I'm in rewrites now to make the show work with about seven actors. Yeah. Total. Because I remember when I when I looked at the cast list, I said, wow, that's awfully ambitious yeah. because it's a lot of people to pay. It makes yeah. it a difficult show. So now you've, you've had uh, composers, lyricists. How much of the show that you wrote is still yeah. in the show? Well, it is completely in like my 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 the show story is, is yours, right. right? The story because the story is loosely based on my own experiences. So one uh -huh. of the first things when Taylor, my lead, when he gets approached uh, doing by when while he's go go dancing, his answer is, "I can do that. I'm a real actor." Uh, and the other guy says, "Well, what have I seen you in?" And he doesn't have an answer. That's kind of how I felt when 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 people were approaching me because sure. I didn't know that a lot of guys that I was dancing with at Mickey's had done porn right I didn't know that that it was so close go-go dancing and and shooting porn right uh I had I had done a play a Ronnie Larson play called making porn which making a lot porn. of people have done and there's a great light and it's about a struggling actor who does porn yeah. to kind of make ends meet and he doesn't want to because he keeps saying to his wife because he's straight that yeah. uh it will jeopardize my acting career and she says to him you don't have an acting career you have an auditioning career and a callback career but if you don't have a lot at risk in a way it frees you to try anything yeah that is funny like if you if you ever watch the show and i hope i'm i'm fingers crossed that you're going to see it next year or as i said online 
um, this is our uh, our want song, like the the first song that the lead sings. Like he sings about auditioning and that he doesn't book anything. Um, but this is his chance to become a cha a star in a different universe. Because right. um, as I said, it's based loosely on my own experiences, but I wanted to make it a coming of age story because mm -hmm. I wanted to have like this young naive guy um, who starts doing porn as it becomes very successful um, and has a lot of sex, obviously. But he's also looking for the love love in all the lovers that he has because ultimately it's a love story as well and I wanted to make it um, a coming of age story because for, for younger guys because I think like you and me when we came out we mm -hmm. actually had to talk to people in a bar to get laid now right. you only have to go on grinder and Click. stuff you send an ass picture or a dick picture and you can get laid so you have an abundance of sex but i feel to really connect with someone yeah you do to, to feel a connection it's it's super hard and without bashing the porn industry because i'm also humanizing the porn industry i want to show that having a lot of sex is not always that fulfilling. Sometimes you just want to have something deeper. And one of the songs is called All the Lovers. I always end up alone. Where's the love and all the lovers I've known? Yeah, well, and now, now you're producing, you're writing, you're not acting. Do you want to act still? No. Oh, no, you don't. no, I okay. was, I was, I mean, porn acting, yes. I, I also have a Just for Fans account. Um, Why? I, <laughs> I will probably. I think Hans Berlin is probably not retired yet, uh, but well, because of because he? of well because of Corona, there was not really any any work because also right? porn, even just for fan sites you couldn't you couldn't uh, shoot anymore. Um, so, but I don't want to act as an actor anymore. I'm totally fine with being in the back of the theater and see how the audience responds to something I created in my head. With cool. help of my beautiful uh, 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 lyricist and and, and composer, um, to to see like, how people are reacting to shooting. So stuff. you see yourself more as the idea man and the producer, yes. bringing the elements together. I'm totally fine at some point to disappear into the background and just <laughs> to see how people are reacting as that to something that I'm creating. And and uh, what was amazing. Um, when I started out, I had some doubters, especially from my country. I, I said, I love Germany. Oh, sure. I love my home country. But a lot of the times people are like, oh, no, you're going to fail. Nobody wants to see a, a show about porn stars. And we actually we were super successful because the only people that were not afraid was the audience. Uh -huh. um, we invited you for a preview, but we we yeah. had to cancel one of the previews because yes. we for a new musical we ran out of rehearsal times and we had to cancel right. one of the previews. And I think then you were traveling, you couldn't come. And to then I was nights. traveling, and then the next time, uh, the yeah. the girl in the show had yes. twisted her ankle or something. It had been yeah. rushed to the hospital, and I showed up, and they said. The ambulance just left. I mean, it was just crazy that day. So, yeah, it um, was. It was. It was uh, the only woman in the show, Carol, <laughs> who yeah. plays a character called Mister Sue. And who is Mister Sue based on? Well, Mister Pam, I'm assuming. Mister Pam, correctly. So, so because when I wrote it, I was like, "How am I going to get a woman to gay porn?" And then well. I have met Mister Pam before. I've never filmed with Mister Pam. Oh, really? But, yeah, but then then I I looked her up and I thought like her her story is so interesting that when she yeah. started working for Falcon, Chuck Holmes, the owner, he didn't want a, a straight woman to right. to uh, so the audience knew that a woman was editing gay porn, so they just put a Mister in front of her first name and Sue became uh, sorry Pam became Mister Pam, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, artistic freedom, Mr. Pam became Mr. Sue. Um, we also did colorblind casting. So Mr. Sue is actually Carol Foreman, Foreman an African-American actress. Oh, wow. I love her to death. She was the only one in the show with, with high heels. And yes. in the yes. second weekend, uh, we were sold out and she twisted her And it was ankle. Pride weekend, we should point out. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She twisted her ankle. So we had to cancel the whole the whole weekend's uh, performance. Yeah. And, and, and Which from is that horrible. day on... There totally. is horrible from, for you. Yeah, but from that day on, uh, she was she was um, uh, uh, she had a cane. She needed a cane, and a wow. lot of people said like it actually works because she bedazzled this and it looked it looked beautiful. Um, and then, yes, I said we were super successful. We had the LA Times gave us a shout out, and they 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 mentioned that there's nudity and that. Yes, right. there's a musical about porn now, but they also said uh, uh, it and is it was a, typical, a good story. 
Yeah, they said it's an all-American musical, um, uh, a heartwarming tale of misfits. And I right. thought, like, this is exactly what the show was about. Like I said, it's only the setting um, of the gay porn world. And, that, and was, that was really great that they got it. Yes, totally. And we were nominated for two Ovation Awards by the LA great. Stage Alliance. So I got my first uh, tuxedo in January and went to the award show. We didn't win, but we were nominated. I was nominated for best book of a new musical. Book is like the screenplay. Yeah. And right. then my my composer and my uh, lyricist, they were nominated for best music and lyrics for a new musical. So that was pretty awesome. Save money on the tux. Next time, just wear the tank top. It's fine. <laughs> I, I rented it. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Yeah. You don't need it. Uh, okay. I'm going to bring you back in a second. We're going to have everyone join yeah. us. Great. Um, okay. This has been so much fun. Okay. All right. So I'm going to bring back first, we have Tom Judson. Hello, John. Hello. And we have David Pepsner joining us. And we have Florian Klein. So there we all are. So um, now that we, we've heard everybody's <laughs> stories, I'm curious, was there anything about any of the other stories, Tom, that just sort of hit you like, oh, you know, that I identify with this. Oh my God, so much. In the first place, I want to see both of these shows. This sounds <laughs> oh, really you. fun. But Dave, Dave and I, we've never really talked about it, but we have such similar experiences. It's kind of amazing. It really was amazing to me interviewing him. And I'm like, this is the same story I just heard from Tom. Yeah, and I saw and then, Tom's and show. Great. I thought and both your shows, by the way, both great. And, and then awesome. Lori mentioned Mr. Pam. Oh my God, Mr. Pam. We love her. Oh, yeah. And I had uh, I co hosted, I think, the Grabbies once there in Chicago. David, when you're hearing, you know, Florian's story about, you know, tackling theater and all those experiences, it seems to me that that would be really, you'd identify a lot with that. Well, I just love what he said that he had a story to tell, like I did about being an escort, but I wasn't going to stand on I wasn't either going to write, I started as a film and then the one man show. But I wasn't going to stand on a stage and say, hey, look what I did, if there wasn't some kind of emotional resonance to it, something universal that an audience would pick up on and go, I didn't have his experience, but I have something like that in my life. And that's what Florian did with his show. You know, right. that wasn't just, it wasn't just this sensationalistic, like, ooh, porn stars, you know? There was the humanity of it, I think, is a really important thing to focus on if you're going to do a show like this that has this kind of subject matter. Um, Florian, now I don't know if you had seen either of David's or Tom's shows, but you obviously heard of them. Did that, in, did the fact that other people did it before you, did that give you the courage to move on? Yes, of course. And I also, the, in, in, in February this or January this year, I met uh, uh, Ronnie Larson because I yes. heard of making porn. I saw YouTube videos of perky little porn star. Um, I, oh. like, I'm friends with, I know, I know. I, I, I actually, no, I didn't know that. I just learned that because I saw it on YouTube. I didn't know that he wrote it. So yeah. that was awesome. Okay. Um, I know that Bruce Valange also wrote, uh, uh, he wrote music for, Some for, material uh, for it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, I mean, it was an in, in, uh, inspiration and also fits in my show that there's more to us than just sex, that we all are, are, are human beings who can create something and we have something that's, that, that lives outside the porn world. Um, and Tom, I think that's one of the points that Tom was bringing yeah. up is that, Tom, we have, uh, you can have the porn existence, but it doesn't mean that's all you have. Yeah, and um, I actually wrote a, 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 I was writing a column for a magazine for a while, and I wrote this one column called The Selznick Syndrome, where, as you said, you're, you're branded. My, my point was that there, 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 for many people, there's one thing that to the world at large defines them. And probably for all three of us, well, not David, because he didn't do porn, but <laughs> for Florian and me, it's like, oh, you know, he did porn. It's like, That'll be the first line in our, of our obit. It's like, oh, former porn star. And it's so funny because um, while it's while my porn career is so important to me and I cherish it, it is just one tiny little element of my life. Sure. Yeah. Perhaps the most visible. But um, it's it's so it is, it's it's a very interesting thing. 
Um, and Flory, and I would think for you, it's the same thing is that when you walk into meetings with people to try to get investors, that they are going to say, you know, if they don't know that you've done porn walking in, they're going to know pretty quickly. Was that a difficulty in raising money or did it help you? Well, as my ex said, Hans opens the doors and Florian keeps them open. I think oh. it, got it, it got people interested. And and um, I've learned in, in 2014, I came out about my HIV infection because um, mm -hmm. I got I got I became positive in 2001. And I always was struggling with it because I kept it to myself. And and once I talked about it, I realized people stopped having problems with it when I stopped having a problem with it. And the right. same thing was with my porn career. Like when Shooting Star ran last year, everywhere, like I said, the LA Times put Florian Klein, put Hans Berlin in there. So everybody knew that I was that I was doing porn. So as I said, once again, what I love about this country is um, I was also the producer of Shooting Star, but nobody treated me like, oh, you're just the, the porn star. Like everybody on my team saw that I had a dream that I was working really hard for it and 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 as i said they didn't treat me like a porn star what what we always think that porn stars would be treated just as the, the sure as a piece of meat but you know it's funny yeah. tom, tom let me just go back to you for a quick second is that um you toured in cabaret which is about sort of the seedy underbelly of berlin prior to the war you would mm. think that if any country would be accepted of a porn star doing something, you would think it might be Germany, and yet Florian's experience belies that assumption. That that is pretty interesting that he's had that experience. You know, I one thing Florian just said made me think of something funny that somebody asked me. They said, "Well, what's the biggest difference between doing porn and doing Broadway?" And I said, "The biggest difference is that in porn, you're treated and paid much better." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And but David, the, it, they, they, oh, go ahead, Florian. Yeah, no, by the way, what I meant with Germany was not the, the, the porn, that that was a problem. Um, the German thinking is, is a lot of the times, don't do it, you might fail. And I still love oh. the American way of thinking, try go it, even it. if you fail, at least you've tried it. And as, as much as I love my, my country, they stopped to dream. Because as uh -huh. I said, with the political situation now, people say like, why are you still here? Why don't you go back to your, to your country? And, and do you think like it's better there? And I said, no, I'm still here. I love New York. I love mm -hmm. the energy that this country gives me. So there wasn't discrimination against you for having been a porn star? No, no. Okay, okay, that's good. Just to you clear that up. Passion, passion can take you a long way. Passion yes. can get you over any of those, you know, those uh, brick walls, through the brick walls, because if you believe it, you can make other people believe it. I, I, right. truly, yeah. I truly yeah. believe that, you know. If, you're, if you have doubts, fear gets nothing done. You, you can't get things produced under fear. You know, I'm curious, yeah. David, Florian talked about that. Um, uh, oh, no, excuse me. Tom just said that the difference between porn and uh, Broadway was that you're treated better and paid better in porn. Did you find, having been an actor, that obviously escorting, you talk about it in the show, that it was incredibly lucrative for you in that it allowed you to afford to have a Broadway career? Well, actually, the Broadway career was great. I mean, I had my time on Broadway and it was great. But then after that, I started doing these high profile off Broadway shows, which paid like one third of what I was getting paid on Broadway. Uh -huh. So I wasn't really getting by. And so I kind of bit the bullet and I saw an ad for Maturity Escorts and I went on an actual interview. And I did it, and oh, I found the interview the, story is so funny. It's pretty because you do funny. act it out. It's great. It was it was crazy. It was total crazy. But because of being able to like um, you know make the extra money as an escort, I I was getting by really really well finally. Like money wasn't an issue, and I was I was kind of tapping into everything that I did as an artist, as a sex being, you know, because I'm a caretaker, I'm a romantic, but I'm also a sex pig, and so it all I was like and an actor. I, and an actor, right? I mean, I was doing everything. I was so qualified for all the jobs that I was doing and I was having a really great time. So what can you say? It was the right um, thing at the right time. Now, uh, let me go to Tom for a second. Hold on, Tom. Um, David just talked about uh, his audition. He had an audition process to be an escort. Now, it sounds like for porn, you really didn't have an audition. You sort of did a trial 
video that presumably went out. Oh, wait, hold on. Wait, I think you're muted. Hold on a second. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I, I said, I hope that she, she is still watching because this is one of my favorite moments in my life. When I was in LA and doing 42nd Street and I was in contact with she, she, she said, you know, why don't you come down to the office and we'll see what's, well, I'll take you around and you can see. So I went down and met she, she and his partner and went around, saw where the scenes were shot and the editorial department and everything. And we get back to the office and we're all sitting there and, and she, she's like, you know, we'd really like to work with you. But there's nothing going on right now. And his partner said, well, there is that that twosome that we're doing tomorrow. And we're all quiet for a minute. And then she, she slams her hands on the desk and says, I know what we'll do. We're going to make it a threesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's how it started. So so I went down the next day and shot the scene. Talk about it did, Nick. One of my... <laughs> It was amazing. It was it was so old. It was let's put on a show. You know, well, stuff. you know, one of my favorite stories about Shishi, and it may be apocryphal, but um, she was doing uh, uh, God, uh, I think it was supposed to be, and David actually was involved in a show that was going to be called this. It was going to be called Top to Bottom, and they said there was already a show or a film called Top to Bottom. She said. From top to bottom, and boom, <laughs> then they had a new the move, new movie. But David, weren't you going to work on a show with David Dillon? That oh, was going to be called Top to Bottom. I did party for David. That's no, no, no. But I thought you were trying. You were working on. He wanted to at one point write sort of a vaudeville kind of show. He may not have ever done it, but I, I don't. Think I I wrote a vaudeville show called The Fancy Boys Follies, but well, David that I know involved with it. Okay, no, yeah, there was something very, David I, at one point I, I, wanted to do. Yeah, who knows? Um, uh, and David Dillon, by the way, wrote party. So, so we're get, we're plugging all of our friends here. Um, Florian, did you have when you got into gay porn, did you have an audition experience? I was just thinking about that, but I didn't. I um <laughs> I, I, I was it was pictures. I remember when I when I had my interview with Titan. Well, he was go go dancing at the time. That yes. was kind of audition enough. That but when I had my interview with Titan, um they took pictures and then they told me, You look good, but you have to lose a little bit in the midsection. You have to work out a little harder and lose some uh. weight. Uh, like I had two two months to to do that, and I think I did. I definitely gained my corona corona weight now and corona hair. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> look, or, you know, at this point, at least we're still here. Thank God. Um, yes. So now, um, I'm curious. Each of you now have been doing things during the pandemic. Are you ready? Like when you're allowed to do things, like to just hit the ground running with things, David? What do you think? I'm nervous. I mean, I know like my gym reopened and I'm not ready to go back there yet. Yeah. Um, I've shot stuff. Like I, I shot um, a, a Zoom short film. We did a couple of readings and stuff. And they say they've got all these social distance guidelines for when TV starts again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to, I mean, I'll, I, I'm ready to do certain things, but I'm very, very cautious about it because it's getting worse. I mean, they say there's going to be in the, like a hundred thousand people a day eventually is what's going to happen. And yeah. I'm sorry, I think people are get, going back too fast. I think we need to put our brakes on them, but that's me. You know, I, I'm, I'm being, I'm on the cautious side. Yeah. I have an audio book though, that I'm going into a studio to do, but uh -huh. they, they're taking real precautions. They're spraying and wiping half an hour between people there. I think I'm going to be okay, but I'm nervous about it. Sure, and I'm sure once you get there, if it looks sketchy, you're out. No, I've done it or I've seen them and it's great. Oh, good. They're good. great. Uh, what about you, Tom? Now, you've got the T-shirts going. Is there anything else that you've got in the pipeline that you want to get back to? Well, there sure is because Charles Bush and I had- Oh, you were supposed to be on the road. Yeah, we, had a brand, uh, we have a brand new edition of our cabaret show. Whose first performance performance was supposed to have been March twenty sixth? Yeah, you and, were supposed to also do like this Florida tour that got canceled. Oh, we, I mean, there was a lot. We, we had we had basically had the whole year filled on the calendar, and every single performance has been canceled. So I don't, I just can't imagine when it's going to be possible to do a show in a theater again. 
I, How do you feel about the the be like David said about being cautious and going out? Are there things you are willing to do versus things you are not willing to do at this point? I go out very rare. I stay home as much as possible, and I run out for groceries and to the post office, and that's about it. Yeah. What about producing the teas? Do you uh, uh, is a third party person able to send them out, or do they come to you and you have to send them out? No, it, it's great. The printer actually sends them out directly oh, great. from there, so I don't even have to deal with that. It's wonderful. Great, uh, Florian. How are you doing in terms of you know what you are able to do right now? Obviously, you're able to go and lie and get a tan, so that's good. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm very happy now to be in New York because we used to be a hotspot, and now because of yeah. great leader, yeah, because of great leadership, our numbers are actually pretty low. And I just I got uh, my Corona test today in 48 hours. I know if I have it or not, uh, but I got an antibody test, uh, and that came back positive. So oh, really? I think that yeah, that little head cold that I had in the in the early March, I think that that was probably my Corona. I didn't I didn't have any fever or uh or anything else so i guess like it was just a mild case um but when all of this started and we went into lockdown i lost any kind of income and yeah. just for fans doesn't really pay anything so a friend of mine said hey my 96 year old mother needs a caretaker um because uh, her, her, care, care, her caretakers can't come anymore so right. i moved i moved in there so i'm actually on vacation right now because the daughter is there at the moment so i moved to park avenue on the upper east side and i was there for the last three months and was taking care of a lovely 96 year old woman she looks like a 70 year old woman she goes to the bathroom alone she showers alone but i had to cook i had to remind her to take her pills she has a, a, a mild case of dementia doesn't so look a to... day over 70 you know that's she, she, how she... i want to be described <laughs> i know um and we've spent some really great time together uh, uh -huh. i i had to explain COVID. i had to explain corona a million times sometimes it felt a little bit like roundhog days uh because of her well, dementia yeah. but it gave me it gave me a purpose um uh, i did something good uh it was also paid really well as well yeah. um and i had enough time to write uh shooting star to rewrite shooting star work on that production oh good and i'm writing about this whole experience uh during the lockdown like i'm, I'm attempting to write my first play now about uh uh, this caregiver experience because her son died uh, of AIDS in 93 wow. and uh, that is it's interesting yeah it's interesting like, i want to write how it is when the sun appears as a ghost in in that apartment mm. out of loneliness because i also haven't had sex in, in like in three months i haven't touched another human being because i'm super careful uh it shows that i don't have any symptoms if i get if i get corona um as my antibody test showed but i don't want to be a carrier and give it to her because it might kill her right because so we I'm don't know super anything. careful yeah, right. so I'm super careful. Uh, I'm not hugging anyone. I'm not touching anyone. And that's been stressful. It's for your mental health. It's not great. Yeah. But on the other hand, it almost makes me wish I were a 98 year old woman because I could have <laughs> you giving me a sponge bath. I'd be ecstatic. You know, Billy, yeah. I, I, I have a side business as a personal organizer. And I, yes, love, you do. I absolutely love it. And my clients, right before this, there's this lovely couple in their 80s. And we were Where just you, moving them in. We just finished moving them in and then they had to get their closets and I, I couldn't do their closets. They want me to come. I'm like, no, you're in your eighties. I think I'm okay, but I'm not comfortable doing that. Right. And so, and I miss it, you know, I guess I could do people's garages since they're wide open, but I miss it. I or love just go in in a hazmat suit or something. Exactly. Which makes it a lot of fun. I know. And a little hot, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I, I have just had so much fun with all of you. I want to just, I, I want to post a few things to sort of promote everything. So David, uh, if people want to see David and really, why wouldn't you? Uh, let me just hold on. Is everything working? Okay. Yes, it is. So uh, this is his only fans page. Um, and, uh, and, and all my guests, uh, if you didn't see, look on the side, this private chat, send me your links. So that's his. And so, uh, I assume the, the rates are reasonable. Are there Corona rates? 
<laughs> is there a little Corona sale going on, David? No, but it's reasonable. Oh, all right. Well, you know, if you say you saw it on Billy Masters, maybe you'll get a little break. No, I don't even I, know how I, to do all that. They have all these special things. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't. Like, yeah, I know. It's too technical for me, you know. Uh, and then, of course, Tom Judson, if you want to look for him on Etsy, you can look from, oh, my God, we're never going to remember all that. But, yeah, there it is. <laughs> but uh, it's Etsy.com slash shop. Dosh. And I bet if you did stopped at the Tom's Trendy Tees, maybe you'd find something. What do you think, Tom? Maybe. Oh, wait, you're muted again. Sorry. Are you back? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah why, you're back. If, if you just do, do a Google search for anti mame T-shirt, it will get you there faster. <laughs> and uh let me see do i have uh do i have a banner from you okay so uh florian do you have anything going on yeah it's all shooting star musical uh on all the social media platforms hashtag social uh hashtag shooting star musical hey, I'm typing it's it on in instagram facebook twitter and you can follow and i can't really add i feel bad advertising my my just for fans right now because I'm running out of content. I'm glad that I shot a lot of content before, but right now is I can't I can't shoot anything. And yeah, I think I don't want to do Boy, another jerk off video. Okay. You know, if, <laughs> if only that 98 year old woman was game, because then you <laughs> you're there anyway. See, this is if you were giving me a sponge bath footage It'd be right different. <laughs> yeah, it would be a little different um guys i want to thank you all this was just so much fun and you're all just such delights i uh i i can really encourage people when this is all over when you can see tom and charles on the road when you can see david pevsner's uh dvd or stream it someplace soon, I swear to God, I and florian's musical shooting star i mean these are great projects and um really up oh, there it is um we really want to uh thank you for coming by it was just so much fun and it was a perfect match of all of you and if you just hang out when i after i wrap i'll come back and talk to you for a minute so thank you all i'm going to say goodbye individually tom thank you so much david i enjoy you and florian my new best friend thank you so much for being on <laughs> Uh, guys, thank you for watching BillyMasters.com Now there, my friend Freddie is going to be so ecstatic I actually stuck to an hour and a half um, Don't forget Thursday We have Sam Harris And uh, Billy Gilman uh, If you have nothing better to do Go to Lynn Samuel Um, and of course, uh,